Good evening everyone. I will be presenting two interesting cases. An apparently healthy 23 year old female came with diminution of vision in the left eye greater than right eye since 4 months which was associated with pain and redness since 4 days. She had history of similar episodes in the past over 12 years which got alleviated with painkillers. Her systemic history was non-contributory. Right eye vision was 6 by 18 and left eye was counting fingers 2 meter. Anterior segment examination of the right eye was unremarkable and of the left eye showed congestion. On fundus examination, the media was clear in both eyes. In the right eye, there was an orangish plaque like lesion with distinct margins superior to the disc along with pigmentary changes in the macula. In the left eye, there was subretinal flowing with fluid along with a deep retinal orangish lesion in the macular region. Fundus autofluorescence of the right eye revealed an area of hyperautofluorescence superior to the disc. Of the left eye revealed an area of hyperautofluorescence more so in the inferior macula. OCT of the right eye revealed attenuation of the photoreceptor layer in the center of the macula. Of the left eye revealed intraretinal fluid along with subretinal fluid. There was subretinal hyperreflective material along with RP undulations and thickening of the choroid. Fluorocene angiogram, there was tippled peripapillary hyperfluorescence in the right eye with late disc hyperfluorescence. There was peripapillary and macular hyperfluorescence in the left eye along with late disc hyperfluorescence. ICGA of the right eye revealed a hyposinocent area superior to the disc. There was an area of hypofluorescence hypofluorescence in the macular region of the left eye. There was T sign on the B scan of the left eye. Investigations revealed an elevated ESR. So we considered a diagnosis of posterior scleritis with a differential of VKH. The uh, pet food was started in the left eye and IV steroids were given in view of subretinal fluid in the left eye. Right eye was stable throughout the course of stay in the hospital and vision improved slightly to 6-12 parts. In the left eye, there was resolving subretinal fluid along with improvement of vision to 6-18 after three doses of IV steroids. The patient was discharged on oral steroids and azothioprine. On subsequent follow-ups, right eye remained stable. Left eye vision gradually improved to 6-6 partial on gradual tapering of steroids and stepping up of IMT. However, the choroidal elevation persisted. Patient, however, was lost to follow up and she reviewed again after three and a half months. This time she presented with loss of vision in both eyes. Right eye had counting finger one meter and left eye was 6 by 60. Both eyes there was subretinal fluid. The orangish plaque was similar in the right eye. Whereas in the left eye there is obvious increase in the size of the orangish lesion seen previously. Both eyes the OCT showed subretinal fluid with RP undulation and thickening of the choroid. In the left eye, there was a almost localized <coughs> thickening of the uh, uh, choroid with intralesional hyperreflectivity. This time around, there was increase in the peripapillary hyperfluorescence 
in both types on fluorocene angiogram. ICG showed an area of hypersinescence in the macular region in the left eye. B scan of both eyes showed a pseudo optic nerve sign and subtenance fluid in the left eye. Investigations revealed a elevated ESR and a clearance was taken to start IV steroids. On IV steroids, we see gradual flattening of the RP undulations with the reduction of choroidal thickness and subretinal fluid with improvement of vision. Likewise, we see some improvement of vision in the left eye with the persistence of the deep retinal orangish lesion. Five doses of IV steroids were completed, but improvement of vision was limited because of loss of ellipsoid zone in the left eye. The patient was subsequently discharged on oral steroids as well as azathioprine. To summarize, this was a most probably a case of recurrent posterior scleritis, which was bilateral and a rapidly growing choroidal osteoma following recurrent inflammation, which is very, very unique and unusual. The second case was of a 18 year old female who came with diminution of vision of both eyes in 6 months. There was history of multiple episodes of recurrent pain and redness over a period of 2 years. There was no history of TB or TB contact. There was no history of any pulmonary complaints, fever, night sweats, skin lesions, weight loss and past hospitalizations. Vision in the right eye was 6 by 36 and left eye was 6 by 24. On anterior segment examination, there were 5 KPs in the right eye and old KPs in the left eye. Anterior chamber revealed plus 1 cells in both eyes. There were posterior cyanide in both eyes as well as complicated cataracts in both eyes. In both eyes, there was mild vitritis, disc was hyperemic, there were numerous intraretinal lesions all over the fundus and in the macula there was deep retinal orangish lesions in both eyes. OCT revealed interesting finding, there were a wide intraretinal lesions in both eyes along with intraretinal cystoid spaces. There were also choroidal bumps visualized in both eyes. On fluorocene angiogram, there was extensive capillary background leakage with hyperfluorescence of some of the lesions seen clinically along with late disc hyperfluorescence. HRCT chest showed mediastinal lymph adenopathy and MANTU was positive. Rest of the investigations were within normal limits. So we treated it as a case of presumed ocular tuberculosis with IV steroids and ATT was started along with topical steroids and cycloplegics. IV steroids were given along with intravitreal steroids and the patient was discharged on oral steroids along with azathioprine. ATT was continued. OCT revealed some resolution of intraretinal fluid but persistence of the choroidal bumps. On local and systemic steroids along with IMT, and ATT, there was resolution of intraretinal lesions in both eyes. However, there was persistence of the deep retinal orangish lesion in the macular regions of both eyes. 
OCT showed persistence of macular edema in the right eye but resolution of edema in the left eye. The choroid elevations were persistent and quite resilient to treatment in both eyes. As the patient developed dry cough on ADT, the patient was referred to the pulmonologist for further evaluation. On oral steroids, ADT and IMT, there was resolution of the intraretinal lesions along with persistence of the orangish, deep retinal orangish lesions and macular regions of both eyes. Lorosin angiogram at this visit showed persistent leakage in the right eye accounting for the cystoid macular edema seen on the OCT whereas left eye it shows a quite a lot resolution of the leakage and an area of hyperfluorescence in the temporal periphery. I didn't feel that eye surgery revealed any useful information and B scan was not done for this patient. So before finishing, in the last case, could the choroidal bumps be due to choroidal osteoma is my question. And what is the nature of the intraretinal lesions? Thank you. To develop a choroidal osteoma. So, sir, in your experience, how often have you encountered these kind of choroidal osteomas secondary to an inflammatory pathology? I haven't actually seen one as yet and uh, very interesting case. But only thing is like the FFA is not suggestive of post dentists. It was just showing a disc leakage and it was not showing suggestive of, suggestive of the osteoma as well. Because if you see the lesion is not leaking, the lesion on FFA is actually hypofluorescent. And, and like only the disc was leaking. So we can't explain as to why there is subretinal fluid in the left eye. So uh, other differential, but of course the ultrasound subsequently seems to show a high reflectivity suggestive of calcium. But I don't know if it's really calcium or if the gain was decreased to see if it was higher than the that of the sclera. So the differential diagnosis which I had was a paraneoplastic vitelliform lesion. So the paraneoplastic vitelliform lesions can present like this and they can be hyperfluorescent. So, the FFA was literally not typical of osteosclerosis or of osteoma. That was something which was against whatever the diagnosis is being made. And if it, of course, like there is some inflammatory component to it. That is the reason the lesion regressed with the steroids. And probably the vision is less, not because of the subretinal fluid, because the subretinal fluid is so less to cause a visual decay of 2 by 60. Because we have, have had patients with CSR with uh, such a big elevation, but still having better vision than 2 by 60. So there is a component of optic neuritis. That's the reason the disc, the disc is leaking. So that is that's uh, something which is the reason for the decreased vision. And the steroids probably had an effect on the optic nerve. That is the reason the vision improved. And of course, there is some inflammatory component. That's the reason subretinal fluid went away. I am not, I'm not too sure about the osteoma part of it. Like then, If it is osteoma we are looking at, then the patient has to be looked for to see if it is secondary osteoma, secondary to uh, parathyroidism. Uh, hypoparathyroidism can cause uh, osteoma as well. So that's something which we need to look at. So, yeah, that point is well taken. So apparently the FFA, uh, I think would somebody like to share the FFA one more time for all of us to see how it is because it doesn't look like a frank leak. It's just a late stain what we are seeing. Priyansha, you would like to share that uh, FFA here? Yes, ma'am. I'll try to. And we are also seeing uh, the choroid on the OCT. So, uh, uh, EPR ma'am, would you like to comment on the uh, choroid what is seen on the OCT here? Ekta ma'am. Yes, uh, Supneshwari, thank you so much. Very nice case, Priyansha. Um, I just wanted to see the early uh, FFA part of it and were you able to do any OCT angiography on that? Because sometimes choroidal osteomas also have a network of blood vessels and they can also leak, can have subretinal fluid. Yeah, yeah. 
can have inflammation. So, yeah. ma'am, I have not done an octa, but I have mm -hmm. done an uh, ICG. So, ICG is very interesting. I'm not sorry, I'm not able to share the FFA now. Uh, on the ICG, first the lesion is hypofluorescent, and when uh, there is a recurrence and it becomes thicker, it becomes hyperfluorescent. Um, as if there is a suffusion of blood or there is increase in the vasculature of the lesion. Ma'am, you can go back. Shika, ma'am, you go back on this presentation. Mute it, but. Yeah, it is little more in front. The FFA is coming little more in front. One thing I like to say is that we get couple of patients with orbital inflammatory disease like pseudo tumor. They can also have scler scleritis. So, uh, but I have seen in boys they will have like uh, sometimes this girl she did not have any orbital like muscle thickening on the B scan or anything. But some of them will have uh, scleritis like picture in uh, orbital inflammatory disease. So this girl. Um, of course, uh, according to hormones and all that can also happen. The osteomas can grow. But such rapid growth doesn't matter. Osteomas are uh, relatively slowly growing. Priyansha, but that FFA, I think that, that there was no pinpoint leak, nothing. There was triple fluorescence in the peripapillary region. The case is a little uh, unusual, sir. Yeah. I mean, no, she I can't Shika, ma'am, can you show the presentation, share the presentation one more time and pause it at the FFA? You are muted. Ma'am, you are muted. Ma'am ma is trying to. Actually, I am not used to the Google Meet. And when the patient was having that, uh, that uh, relapse, at that time, patient was having on that Azoran TDS or patient has stopped that? No, sir. The patient has lost, uh, was lost to follow up due to financial reasons for three and a half months. Then she has come uh, with a vengeance. The disease has come back with a vengeance. There has been a severe recurrence. When she came back in the beginning, right, I, I explained to her that the vision may not improve much because of the loss of ellipsoid zone. So I assume there would have been a previous attack in the right eye as well. Now, since the left eye, often it happens in this area. Now, with a good eye also, she is not seen. So, she has come for evaluation. Now, um, so the, all the medication was stopped. This is a common scenario we see in other diseases also. Not only this weak edge, even uh, TB granulomas. Uh, once they stop, treatment initially, they'll come back with an exuberant or a tumultuous sort of a uh, course later on. Very difficult to even salvage the eye. Yep. So, the initial yeah. uh, yes, treatment no, has one. been very aggressive. So, this, this is, yeah. This production is not typical for posteriorsclerosis. It, it is neither of a weak edge nor for oh. a posterior scleritis. Neither of both. You want to see? Yeah, then the, then the OCT, ma'am. ICG? Yeah. ICG, we can see the hypofluorescence when she came in the beginning. In the left eye, especially, we can see. So, next you want the... Next, the OCT, ma'am. Yeah. There are a lot of images yeah. OCT. Yeah. No, the previous one. Previous slide, I think. 12, number 12. Number 12, yeah. So, Shika, can you make it yeah. full screen, please? If I make it full screen, then her volume comes along with it. It's an auto this thing recorded thing, no? If you want it, I can, you can, you can click on, You can click on that mic there and decrease the volume. Okay, okay. You can, you can click on the speaker on the right side down on the slide. I was able to... And vision improved. Like it. One minute. 
Uh, here you want it, no volume. Uh, yeah, you can you can decrease that. No, that's not the volume. That's no, 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 on the on the thing. But like what you had done just before, you had muted it. It was fine. I think if we okay, mute so you. Okay, I'll, I'll I'll make it full screen and mute it. Uh. Mute it completely. Yeah. Yes. So one one above, ma'am. Yeah, for, yeah, yes. So, ma'am, you stay on this. Improvement of vision. Yeah. So now, if we uh, very no, ma'am, you pause it on that. And pause it. No, pause it on the one slide before. The thing is, if I mute it, I can't hear you guys. One oh. minute. So. Yeah, yes. Which one do you want? Well, I think we'll go with the number. Which one do you want, uh, Subdeshwari? I think number eight, 18, 18 is good enough or even, yeah, number 18, 16, is, yeah. You want to see the fundus or the OCT? Yeah, o this. OCT, yeah, the next one now. Yes, now stop at this, ma'am. Yeah, it's there. Yeah. So now you make it full screen. Both eyes. Yeah. Now this is the OCT. Yes, ma'am. Stop at this OCT only. So yeah. Now Priyansha, in in, in this particular frame uh, of OCT, we are really not able to appreciate uh, the uh, uh, the lamellae of the bone, which is supposed to be there actually in a, a choroidal osteoma. Ma'am, in, in the left eye, mm. it looks like a hyper uh, reflectivity within the region. This is not something which we see in a like a choroidal granuloma, say. Like this, in the left eye, we can see an intralesional hyper reflectivity. That wavy thing is there. I assume that that is an osteoma actually, which is growing and got it has got engorged with blood um, during the inflammatory, with the increase in inflammation. I mean, it is rapidly growing. It is uh, rapidly, what I understood is because of the inflammation, there is increase in vascularity and then that will uh, invite more maybe osteoblasts and the osteoma grows pretty rapidly. Otherwise, usually it will slowly grow. In yeah, the osteomas are known to uh, grow slowly and the age group itself is also a little different. Like here, this particular individual is also a little young for that. Ma'am, move on to the next slide where the ultrasound is there. Another this thing is... Around. In the right eye, I felt that... Uh, ah, yeah. Stop at this, ma'am. Yeah. So, but uh, in this particular ultrasound, what we are seeing is definitely there is a, there some is. amount of calcium which is there with so much of uh, back shadowing which we can appreciate. So, MPSR, what is your thought process on this uh, ultrasound? I agree that there is calcium on this. Yeah. That is the right eye. But left eye, I don't think it's showing uh, calcium. There is a calcium plug. So, uh, JB sir, what is your uh, line of thinking in terms of what could be this condition? Like, uh, yeah, choroidal osteoma, that is agreed upon. Now, what was the inflammatory condition? What is the diagnosis it's of this patient? Hyperfluorescence is there. It's definitely inflammatory. So, would you call it, uh, because it didn't look like VKH, it didn't look like uh, posterior scleritis. So, what would you name this as? Because FFA is not very typical of any of these, uh, both the entities. No. I'm keeping it as a kind of a... Uh, uh, mixed diagnosis or undiagnosed condition. I'll treat as an inflammatory disorder that I'm very convinced with the disc hyperfluorescence and quadral thickening. Uh, I'm quite uh, convinced that this is a inflammatory lesion. I will stop at that level. Actually, ma'am, um, if we read a review of literature by Benson, 
the uh, variety of posterior sclerosis can be a lot, like you can have a frank nodular then you can have a chronic posterior sclerosis where uh, they have described uh, rc folds that is because of the chronic inflammation and probably scarring of the sclera so they have said b scan is paramount many of the like there is um, uh, dr watson i think he said that uh, you have to do a b scan this is a common cause of like this is one of the uh, most common missed cause of you know, headache and facial pain posterior sclerosis yeah priya well, the clinical findings can be quite subtle at times yeah you are you are uh, you are thinking as is absolutely right because in this ultrasound ma'am shikha ma'am can you go to the previous slides because in her ultrasound it is quite so uh, though the ffa is not showing anything uh, but the ultrasound is good enough to pick it up now so in more more, more front one ffa so, no ultrasound previous ultrasound what she had done because in that it it actually shows the subtenon widening the subtle subtenon widening which is there so yeah so yeah that one can i come in uh, doctor yes, yes sir yes doctor madhav rav yes it was a nice presentation uh, by doctor priyansha i think the uh, what he said is possibly it looks like a, uh, you know more in favor of a posterior scleritis like we when we have to look into the cause of posterior scleritis what would have caused in uh, favor of a posterior scleritis because on a clinical presentation you look at the bilateral and the uh, you know the vision and the, the fluid in both the eyes uh, uh, i mean then the the oct findings i'm sure if the ffa is not typical of uh, posterior scleritis but the oct is a, a, a case of post, a posterior scleritis and then the ultrasound you have a typical t sign this all put together you, your your diagnosis is you are moving towards the posterior scleritis the only thing is we don't know the reason for posterior scleritis like dr jp sir said it could be a mix you know you treat it as a inflammatory cause and then probably like you said the second time it came with the vengeance and he, by then there was a osteoma it shows up again on ultrasound with a you know very typical calcification and a bar you know uh, so it's the case of the sr is 66 which yeah. indicates a systemic disease yeah there has to be so have you looked into the systemic diseases of posterior any uh, cianka pianka are factors yes. sir the problem is the patient the here the uh, kind of patient we i'm working in rural india and financial problem is there so we do refer to pgi lucknow but still uh, there are a lot of financial problems they are not able to yeah, afford yeah, so at least we yeah i understand we are supposed to be doing the work of uh, in scleritis we should do and Can i have ordered that uh, parathy that uh, parathyroid hormone levels also in her because uh, Uh, once you tell them expensive tests and they feel that the vision is not coming back then sometimes they are lost to follow that is also an issue so in one more thing also is like vitamin d levels it is a good idea to check on that because many of the patients even you see they are all on supplements so wherein the vitamin d hypervitaminosis of d is known to cause uh, calcification because there are two types of calcification when we all describe in the eye you know one is uh, dystrophic one is metastatic calcification dystrophic is always with an abnormal eye metastatic is not with an abnormal eye it is supposed to be the abnormalities elsewhere so where you get the deposition like for instance the scc like this is of course a clear case of choroidal osteoma no doubt on that and very nicely you have you know uh, documented all those things though you practice in rural india that i am i'm sure it is really really wonderful because to pick up a choroidal osteoma in an inflammatory condition and that to so beautifully it is very it's a very nice thing to occur and all of us you know are like uh, Uh, those who know those who don't know because many a times we don't know that the choroidal osteomas can be secondary to certain conditions like inflammation or secondary to a venous occlusion parathyroid. or parathyroid the parathyroid is usually that they are primary causes no sir this is something like a secondary to an ocular pathology not to a systemic pathology so that was a good thing about priyansha to drive in the point of 
to look at uh, an osteoma kind of a picture when we have an inflammatory condition may be it is scleritis or even other inflammatory conditions are known to occur usually pseudo tumor is is one common cause where you will get it but those are conditions again related to igg4 kind of diseases which nowadays are becoming more common in india we are now looking at the igg panels initially we were not looking at igg4 versus igg ratios but now it is important that we look at it when we have these kind of calcifications here so i would like to know if dr vijay tomar would like to contribute to uh, this particular case what is your thought vijay you would like to say something about this madam this was a really very difficult case because that on the basis of that simply the disc staining that uh, as uh, mahesara said that maybe it was something which is presenting initially as optic neuritis because none of the features were very much suggestive of posterior scleritis so maybe that something inflammatory was there which actually lead to the deposition of calcium later on because patient was lost to follow up as as patient was on that azuran i think the situation was under control because inflammation was totally subsided but uh, later on when he lost follow up he developed this and uh, as you have said igg4 diseases maybe something was there in the orbit which we missed initially and that is that was persistent there that inflammation was on the lower side but it was there and it finally presented like this want to go to the next case subneshwari yeah we'll move on into the next case ma'am now priyansha just one question what about any chest x ray yes ma'am we do chest x ray and ct scan for many mm -hmm. of our patients this was uh, apart from calf pain there was no other thing and esr was elevated in the first That's visit there was slight uh, leukocytosis uh, on the slide so uh, we do a routine chest x ray especially when we, when we are giving such strong medication iv steroids as well as uh, imt and um, we are fairly careful we do a chest x ray at least yeah because since this patient had a history a long history of recurrences yes and that is inflammation kind of ignored and maybe local say uh, pain killer um, over the counter medication she was taking and what was the complaint it was loss of vision earlier or it was started with some scotomas ma'am what i understood was she had less vision in the right eye uh but when she became when she came to us she became symptomatic in the left eye so that's why she came to the hospital otherwise she must be tolerating uh, the condition or she must have not come to know because when i was functioning fine and no only symptom would have been like just pain sort of deep seated eye pain or headaches this often happens when one eye is gone they will not come when the other guy i they realize that the other eye is not because these are she is not very educated also they are not uh, uh, and there was no proptosis no right? no 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 proptosis we often do uh, like i said we do get pseudo tumors and i have seen couple of boys with uh, this posterior scleritis pseudo tumor so we do muscle thickness on b scan and we refer to the oculoplasty department to rule out any other like orbital issues priyansha you said that patient was having leg cramps that uh, calf muscle tenderness or something yeah from how many days so Is that was on and off so sir, we should do ideally ana profile and anka and ra factor the problem is that uh, uh, we have to admit the patient and treat the patient so the cost they won't be able to afford it only they'll go without treatment so to avoid that i don't order the full battery right away i give step by step and eventually i do refer the patient for further evaluation the calf muscle tenderness is it because and of some and not tenderness just some aches some aches some, some that uh, some serum electrolytes or something because of that dermatomyositis type of thing or something muscular 
So before giving IV steroids, we do a KFT where uh, electrolytes are usually checked, uric acid le levels. That was okay. No, no, serum calcium and other things. Serum calcium and I have not checked. Because, because, because that calcium was deposited there. And that maybe some high calcium thing will be there. Because of that, the patient was having uh, feeling that uh, uh, pain in the calf muscle. Sir, actually in Ostoma, there is a very nice article by Susan Trimble and what she has said is that where there is high vascularity, the osteoblasts, they lay down bone, like proper lamellae with the Harvesian canal system. So the calcification is different from bone formation in the eye. This is what they were saying. And probably these uh, inducible cells, they are circulating in the bloodstream or they can be seeded in the eye. So high vascular, I think PCV is also associated with the development of choroidal osteoma. Yeah, in certain, uh, they have, they, there are reports in PCV as well and uh, choroidal hemangiomas also. Yeah, even trauma can lead to that. Yeah, yes. trauma also. So we will move on to the next uh, case of the day, which Priyansha is going to be presenting. The second case was of a 18 year old female who came with diminution of vision of both eyes in six months. There was history of multiple episodes of recurrent pain and redness for two years. There was no history of TB or TB contact. There was no history of any pulmonary complaints, fever, night sweats, skin lesions, weight loss, and past hospitalizations. Vision in the right eye was 6 by 36 and left eye was 6 by 24. On anterior segment examination, there were 5 KPs in the right eye and old KPs in the left eye. Anterior chamber revealed plus 1 cells in both eyes. There were posterior cyanide in both eyes as well as complicated cataracts in both eyes. In both eyes, there was mild vitritis. This was hyperemic. There were numerous intraretinal lesions all over the fundus. And in the macula, there was deep retinal orangish lesions in both eyes. OCT revealed interesting finding. There were avoid intraretinal lesions in both eyes along with intraretinal cystoid spaces. There were also choroidal bumps visualized in both eyes. On fluorocene angiogram, there was extensive capillary background leakage with hyperfluorescence of some of the lesions seen clinically along with late disc hyperfluorescence. HRCT chest showed mediastinal lymph adenoma and man was positive. Rest of the investigations were within normal limits. So we treated it as a case of presumed ocular tuberculosis with IV steroids and it started <coughs> along with toxic steroids and cyclopegics. Why give dexamethasone? Why not uh, IV So again, for the cost thing, oh. uh, it is cheaper. So it costs about little more than five thousand for the patient for the entire stay. For the uh, cost reasons only, okay. IV steroid, and it works pretty well, sir. Now I've been like using it for like uh, more than three years, about four years. Oral steroids along with isothyroid. ATP was continued. OCT revealed some resolution of intraretinal fluid but persistence of the choroidal bumps. On local and systemic steroids along with IMT and ATT, there was resolution of intraretinal lesions in both eyes. However, there was persistence of the deep retinal orangish lesion in the macular regions of both eyes. OCT showed persistence of macular edema in the right eye, but 
dissolution of edema in the left eye. The choroid elevations were persistent and quite resilient to treatment in both eyes. As the patient developed dry curves on ADD, the patient was referred to the pulmonologist for further evaluation. On oral steroids, ADD and IMT, there was a resolution of the intraretinal lesions along with persistence of the orangish, deep retinal orangish lesions and macular regions of both eyes. Fluorocene angiogram at this visit showed persistent leakage in the right eye accounting for the cystoid macular edema seen on the OCD. Whereas left eye shows a quite a lot resolution of the leakage and an area of hyperfluorescence in the temporal periphery. I didn't feel that eye surgery revealed any useful information and B scan was not done for this patient. So before finishing, in the last case, could the choroidal bumps be due to choroidal osteoma is my question. And what is the nature of the intraretinal lesions? Thank you. The second case is a straightforward is intraretinal tuberculosis uh, and um, with the retinal vascular disease, there's so much of inflammation uh, that the retinal vessel is also inflamed. Yes, Dr. Yeah, so we are seeing a lot of uh, intraretinal tuberculosis also. And we see tuberculosis at various levels, at the choroidal level, at the intraretinal also, a lot of retinitis cases. But the thing is, sir, they respond to steroids. In this case, while like in a busy OPD, once you give steroids, say to a tubercular or even sarcoid granuloma, they will uh, immediately flatten out within a few days. But this case, these uh, I was not very sure what is the problem. Is it inadequate treatment or um, does this patient need biologicals? And like the avoid lesions no, I would not give on the OCT this are very so unique. So high positive. One to so high positive, I will not give biology. So, but the uh, actually patient did not feel much improvement of vision because she had a cataract, and then she was referred to a pulmonologist. He said, "You have no problem." So they stopped all the treatment altogether. They stopped all the treatment. Then the patient was lost to follow. So, I think the OCT findings were quite intriguing in this case. When the patient was, I mean, it's very unusual to see those uh, peri those avoid uh, lesions. In my opinion, yeah. what so, so any of the uh, our seniors like? What is their experience on such a intraretinal involvement, and why it's not responding to steroids? We have given local steroids, uh, intravenous steroids. Why the patient is not responding? So actually, Priyansha, in your patient, she's a 18 year old girl. So usually what happens is that too when you are treating a tuberculosis, what we have all seen these uh, with these uh, adolescent category patients, they tend to have some kind of a paradoxical reaction wherein their response is way too, that is because of the uh, immunogenicity which these people are going through. So sometimes in these patients, uh, anti-VEGFs are very good to help and you add on anti-VEGF in these patients your granuloma also tends to recover faster and of course the retinal lesions. See, you, you are not going to stop the systemics what you are giving. But I think uh, giving uh, supplementary anti-VGFs helps in these patients. Sir, MPS sir, what would you like to say sir? I think Dr. Manisha has published uh, granulomas where they have treated with intravitreal moxifloxacin along with anti vgf with great response. So probably that's another thing which can be considered. Sir, but the intraretinal lesions, uh, are they very common? Yeah, that, that avoid like lesions seen on the OCT, uh, I think they are very, very unique. 
They are just used. Part, it is just uh, surrounding yeah. perivascular cuffing of the cells, accumulation of cells around the vessels. But uh, uh, on the FFO. Who has described intentional tuberculosis? So who? Shoma uh, Basu, sir. Yes. 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 Basu is, uh, yeah. yes. 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 The, he has demonstrated intraretinal granulomas also. And so I think about this also because We do see a lot of uh, intraretinal tuberculosis, but this is not the phenotype, sir. We see retinitis lesions along, along with uh, vasculitis, but we don't see these avoid sort of lesions. No, actually, you know, like, no, uh, what you also tend to see is like not only this, if your patient had any intraorbital surgery, you will also see the patient coming with orbital inflammation. We have had cases that way also. So we did publish that as well. So it is not uncommon for patients at this age group to present with lesions at all levels. May it be at the vascular level, the retinal level, the choroidal level, and even the orbit also we tend to see. So this is yes. not, uh, yeah, this is something which we should understand because they're all towards a granuloma. That is what you must understand, that it is a granuloma, it doesn't disappear very faster also. And uh, like what Dr. MPS said, uh, sir said, same thing, JB sir also usually, he asks for uh, intravitreal moxie with anti-VEGF injections, which many a times we have given and seen the response. It, it is slow. It does, you don't have a dramatic recovery in these patients. You have to be slow, patient enough. They take sometimes more than three, four months for you to see any appreciable response in these patients. And the other thing, Priyansa, what I think that we should also consider MDR-TB yes. if it is not responding at all. Because there are case reports which uh, where the patient was having MDR-TB or XDR-TB. At that time, we will have to change the regime. We will uh, uh, have to uh, take the help of pulmonologist. That why the patient is not responding. And suppose as a uh, GSI madam has said that sometime that, uh, uh, that re paradoxical reaction is there. And I think that at that time, if you are having paradoxical reaction, uh, we will have to increase the dose of uh, oral uh, prednisolone. We see paradoxical all the time. So we have a lot of uh, SLC patients and uh, we usually give IV steroids because we have usually have a very aggressive course of disease. So when we admit, once you start ATT, within, actually within days, the lesions start increasing due to the release of mycobacterial antigens. That I understand, sir. But this case is respond. The intraretinal lesions are they have responded only the choroidal. They have not responded. I think you should have given the trial of that uh, uh, intravitreal moxie plus anti VGF. I think that ocular tuberculosis webinar on our USI uh, that portal that Molly has presented a beautiful case of uh, choroidal tuberculosis where she has given that uh, intravitreal moxie along with that uh, anti-VGF and the patient has responded nicely. We don't give uh, intravitreal moxie and anti-VGF in this type of phenotype. We give usually in vascular granulomas, usually there'll be a wrap-like lesion. Uh, in those respond very well to oral steroids, uh, ATT and intravitreal anti-VGF. And actually it is really very difficult to say that the patient is responding to anti-VGF or moxifloxacin because moxifloxacin comes in the second line of drugs for ATT, for the tuberculosis. Yes. Very difficult to say. So, so can it be some, can the orangish lesion be osteoma or it's just a choroidal granuloma? That is my question because in the first case also, actually first a DNB student has seen and she has written choroiditis. So, uh, the take home will be that we can have uh, this uh, osteomas developing in inflammation and if we are just injecting, say in the first case, we are injecting all these intravitreal injections, it will be of no use actually because this is a sort of a secondary phenomenon. It is not uveitis. So, we are kind of over treating the patient. Whereas, if you have an actual granuloma, it will respond to treatment. That was, I mean, that's what I was thinking. See, that is where your multiple modality of investigation comes into place, wherein you will have to, you know, keep your eyes, ears open to the patient's history and to all the imaging modalities, what you have. And ultrasound is a very simple device for you to use 
and because it is available easy to use why not use it to the best of the discretion to know what we are dealing with so i i think uh, now uh, so i will ask jb sir to you know summarize and tell us what is the take home message that he is going to convey for all of us on this particular evening to manage because he is he is got the vast experience in management of these kind of patients so jb sir can you please tell us uh, what you would want all of us to follow and understand from these two cases so i think is that both the cases apart from imaging that uh, careful observation is uh, most crucial to find out that you know that uh, or cradle ostomy we could make out uh, from that look at it itself the pseudopodia like presentation and keep an open mind and uh, be um, uh, confirm with the clinical presentations with confirmation with imaging technique which you are ha having with you that's the power the first case second case is the tuberculosis in our country it, it would be uh, uh, keep on the top on the list and uh, there can be protein manifestation intraretinal tuberculosis is not that very unusual and uh, treating with anti tubercular treatment would be over oh, that one and if not responding uh, probably a newer form of therapy i would prefer to give uh, moxifloxacin with uh, moxifloxacin with anti tb treatment i have given some of the patients on instead of ethambutal moxifloxacin orally and um, they do process in abdomen orally um, they do respond with that kind of um, newer antibiotic i would like to ask the other panelists also on their uh, opinion on the second case dr ekta Priyansha, I feel uh, just try to do an ultrasound and monitor the patient. Your patient, you can't say is not responding. Patient is responding. Intraretinal fluid is definitely reducing. And most of the time, these patients are slow to respond in terms of granuloma. So if you are looking for a formation of choroidal osteoma, just keep monitoring on ultrasound. MPS sir, what is your uh, comment, sir? Very interesting cases, sir, definitely. So, uh, I, this the second case is not showing a calcium as of now. So, probably we need to follow up to see if in case developing that, then then probably uh, once again an inflammation causing that. So, uh, but I, I'm surprisingly, I think the lesion decreased in size with steroids, isn't it? Yes, sir. The uh, intra-retinal lesions they sort of resolve, but the choroidal bumps were quite persistent. And what because uh, this is something I do like we all do every day. We give steroids, and the within weeks the the bumps they flatten down if it is a granuloma. That's why now in retrospect, these two does. Uh, Uh, the second case, retrospectively, I'm thinking, can it like, is it really a granuloma or it is something else going on? That was Not why. But like, if it was an, if it was not tumor, like it is decreasing in size, isn't it? That's something which was the previous case. It didn't decrease in size; it actually increased in size. But in this yes. case, that the coronal elevation seemed to decrease a little bit. So that that was something which was probably not to say it was an osteoma, and if you see the uh, on the OCT, the intra lesional characteristic of this lesion was different from the previous case. So that was also a little different to say if it is an osteoma. Probably too early to say, but I'm not too sure if you can call this as an osteoma like the previous case. So not exactly the similar uh, the OCT appearance or on the uh, ultrasound as well. But very great uh, observations and the wonderful pickup from, from from both the cases. Like wherever you are practicing, despite all the limitations, you have done a great job. We have uh, the best uh, equipment. Only thing is, uh, the patients sometimes they are not affording. We have uh, no dearth of equipment or anything, but uh, the patients, uh, nor expertise is also not uh, in lacking. But. Uh, I would say, <laughs> but Obviously, the patient, the advice. <laughs> yes, yes. 
very wonderful cases and well documented good observation thank you ma'am so if anybody else has any comments to make the audience uh, do they have any questions to ask or they would like to make a comment they are open to or you can share it in the uh, chat box also how many people have joined ma'am there are many people coming in going <laughs> You know, I did say that. Yeah, even for a minute, if you, Dr. Vimal Swaroop from US is there, sir. We would like to say a hello to you, sir. I I, I thought I saw him. Yeah, he's there, but he's muted. Muted. Yeah. so i would like to thank everybody who had joined today and this is a very informal discussion which we keep every month to remind that uh, the grand rounds period which we used to have in shankar netralia uh, earlier where all of us used to be together among all the departments and then discuss cases so this is a uh, this is a very informal gathering and we hope to have it every month Uh, one case which can be discussed or two cases and uh, and people who would like to sh uh, you know present can uh, given their uh, i mean when they would like to present they can send in those details and we'll be happy to you know accommodate each and everybody and uh, we can have a good discussion and wherever people are from the remote places they can always use this platform you know to come in and share their cases and it was nice of priyansha to pick up so many points so well and and you know it was really a uh, uh, i i should say it was enlightening for all of us to hear you priyansha it was really so much so it, it did remind me of uh, old vr classes which we've stopped attending now that's really really nice very yeah. nice. so i thank each and everybody uh, those who have taken part to, to be here and we will also be sharing the uh, recorded presentation on the ekalavya so that will be available for people those who missed this they can attend that as well so i thank each and everybody thank you one and all and have a great evening can we have a photo yeah can we have the cameras on i would also i would like to thank all <laughs> for the opportunity and i would also like to thank my hod here dr uh, alok singh and my colleagues and fellows and uh, we really enjoy seeing very interesting cases it's fun and uh, when patients get better i think it's a great happiness in life but the patients who are lost to follow up and such intriguing cases they do stay in my memory and i like to discuss with my teachers and my seniors like what we could have done differently and uh, like in for the future thank you ma'am for the opportunity okay thank you good night thank you good, good night good, good night all of you bye bye bye, bye. 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 bye.